everybody knows the story of um, the big, the log cabin that Abraham Lincoln grew up in. It really is very, very central to our sense of who we are as Americans and what the American dream actually means. Um, what you see, this beautiful house, was a house in Lexington, Kentucky that would have been the territories back in the days pre-Civil War that um, Mary Todd Lincoln was born. This is her birthplace. And her birth was on such a more uh, elevated level than Abraham Lincoln. He made a little joke, although God managed with just one D, the Todds required two. Now, when you think of who were the really important people if you grew, were an American in the time of Mary Todd Lincoln, Henry Clay, Ninian Edwards, Dolly Madison, three major American figures. If you look in terms of the, what would be considered the West, because do consider that this point in history, California is way out there. The West is a place like um, Lexington, Kentucky. Ninian Edwards was one of the foremost people who really established um, Illinois. Henry Clay, really very close to became president of the United States, is a very famous negotiator. And Dolly Madison is still one of the most famous first ladies we ever had. She really <coughs> ran the um, functions for both Thomas Jefferson and her husband, um, James Madison. And um, Dolly Madison is directly related to Mary Todd Lincoln. Henry Clay was a very good friend that they could walk down the street. Mary Todd Lincoln would joke with as a child. Um, Ninny and Edwards, ultimately his son, married into Mary Todd Edwards' family, so, or Ma Mary, Mary Todd's family. <coughs> okay, so here she is. Mary Ann Todd is her full name, born December 13th, 1818. And um, when you were talking about her personality, a uh, contemporary said, like an April day, sunning all over with laughter one moment, the next crying. She was exceptionally intelligent. Um, she had a, a large family, as you can see there to the right. Um, her mother died when she was six, um, and she had a stepmother, and had five siblings from her mother and eight siblings from her stepmother. But of the young girls who were given an education, she was given absolutely the best education, and she did the most with it. The, um, she was not only excellent in the way we think of as educa uh, being educated, she was excellent at the home things that women needed to do in her day. And she was a very fast, very efficient seamstress and knitter and all of the things that they called the domestic arts back then. Now, she's lived Lexington, Kentucky, slave state, mm -hmm. but she had kind of an ambivalent relationship to slavery even before the Civil War. The Todds had a Quaker anti-slavery connection, um, but the Todds that Mary Todd grew up with did actually own slaves. She had two very powerful grandmothers um, on her dead mother's side and her father's side. Both of them freed slaves either in their will and sometimes actually freed slaves during their lifetime because of their opposition to slavery. And also, Mary would have probably seen slave markets and certainly know, knew of controversial interracial relationships among the powerful people she grew up with. Now, you see there Ninian Edwards, and you see his namesake son, and there you see Mary Todd Lincoln's oldest sister, Elizabeth Todd. Um, she married into that family, and um, therefore moved to Illinois, which of course is a non-slave state, and started to establish a very strong, or be part of the very strong connection between Kentucky and Illinois. And Mary, when she came out, visited her sister in Springfield. And there you can see <laughs> the beautiful house that she went to. This Springfield, Illinois, was called the Athens of the West. And the place that Ninian Edwards lived with Mary's sister came to be known as Aristocracy Hill. It was a showcase for the Springfield, Illinois elite. So there you see 
Mary Todd Lincoln. This is the earliest known daguerreotype of her. And um, this was a quote about what she was like when she was out among all the aristocracy there. Not aristocracy, I'm saying it. It's American, of course. Um, <laughs> she could make a bishop forget his prayers. Now, the uh, Todd's had very specific ideas about the level at which Mary Todd Lincoln should marry into. So she was, they, they very seriously tried to get her to consider Patrick Henry's godson, um, the wealthy widower who was very well connected not only with money but also with um, the important American connections, Edwin Webb, and of course, famously, you may have heard of Stephen Douglas, who comes up a little later in the um, Lincoln-Douglas debates. <clears throat> but Mary had her own ideas about who she thought was really interesting and had potential. You may recognize the guy. This is one of the very early pictures of um, Abraham Lincoln. When she met him, he was a state legislator, legislator. He was a surveyor. He was a lawyer. And she saw him as a diamond in the rough. <clears throat> now, there were some very famous Lincoln romances before, not so much necessarily famous to Mary Todd Lincoln, but famous now, that um, he had before he met Mary Todd. Anne Rutledge, um, who was a, uh, not at the level of Mary Todd Lincoln, she was the daughter of a tavern owner, um, beautiful woman, and that isn't her, it's just I wanted to give a picture of what a tavern might look like at that point. I couldn't find a picture of Anne Rutledge. And um, very famously, he fell in love with Anne Rutledge. It looked like they were going to get married, and Anne Rutledge died, and he went through a um, period and, and feelings which most people don't argue is, is like clinical depression. Very, very harsh when that happened. Um, he had gone through this very harsh depression when his sister died. He had, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of assuming people know a little bit about Abraham Lincoln. If you want to ask later on what his, you, you can certainly ask him, there's lots of experts here. Um, the person that he's also famous for having considered who rejected him is Mary Owens, who rejected him in 1838. And the reason that I thought Mary Owens was particularly worth mentioning in terms of Mary Todd Lincoln is he wrote a very honest letter to Mary Owens explaining what it meant to marry Abraham Lincoln. He said, there's a great deal of flourishing about in carriages here, meaning Springfield, Illinois, which it would be your doom to see without sharing in it. You would have to be poor without any means of hiding your poverty. Now, Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd had a famous two-year off-again, on-again courtship where they appear to have gotten engaged and then this lad period, they didn't appear to be engaged anymore. And at the last minute, they got together again and Mary Todd insisted they needed to get married the next day in, uh, or, or with, without giving notice to her sister, and her sister insisted the marriage take place in that beautiful house that you saw a little earlier. So essentially, it was done very, very quickly. Oh, I forgot, this was a, something, I, I forgot to mention this, is to, to give you a sense of his depression. I will read this one thing. I felt Mary Todd Lincoln deserved this because a lot of discussions of Mary Todd Lincoln are, are was she really attractive enough? And was she, you know, did he not like her because of this? Did he not like her because of that? And I just want to read the words that he wrote during this time to give a sense of how seriously depressed he was when they broke up. I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. Whether I ever shall be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better, it appears to me. Now, I, did, I didn't include that because I'm trying to say, oh, look how you know, heartbroken he was over Mary Todd Lincoln. I'm saying the period of time that he broke the engagement, he was about as depressed as you've ever read a human being being. Um, people were very seriously worried that he might 
commit suicide, people who knew him. So that was the harsh time, but when he got back together, and on November 4th, they announced that they were married. And it's worth mentioning, which doesn't get mentioned quite as often, what a, a, a tremendous leap this was for Mary Todd Lincoln, because she went from this beautiful housing that she lived in to a boarding house. Now, for Abraham Lincoln, this boarding house, he was going from a dollar a week to four dollars a week. So he was really, really increasing the cost of living. <coughs> for Mary Todd Lincoln, this would be something that she would have no experience with. Um, Lincoln referred uh, to a national debt, this debt he needed to pay off every single, um, well, like week, month, over and above what it cost for ordinary living um, expenses. He, more than almost any contemporary lawyer, he would ride the circuit, so he was gone for half the year trying to earn money. He now was out of um, the state legislature, and Mary became pregnant, and she gave birth to a little boy who she had the wisdom to name after her father, who had tried to name two of his own sons after him, but both of those sons had died. And this was the real reconciliation between her powerful family and her new family. She got three gifts from her father, $20 in gold. Um, Lincoln was given a job of debt collection where he could show his prowess. Um, and then she got a $120 annuity. And that from this point in the relationship, Lincoln went from calling her Molly to calling her mother, and they were now finally able to move out of the boarding house. Now, one of the very nice things about Abraham Lincoln is he <clears throat> worked very, very, very hard with all of his might to make money, to become politi successful politically, but he really allowed Mary Todd Lincoln to handle the household, to decide on the furniture, to decide on the finances, to run those things. And a lot of men felt it was a matter of pride that they would be basically in charge of everything. His way of referring to the household things that needed to be done was as the little things. And also, in fairness to Mary Todd Lincoln, he was not actually uh, very good at, at being conventionally aristocratic. He was, he was very much the Lincoln that you may know from legends. Um, uh, and anyway, so. And he made a jump now, not just state legislature, to the Congress. And Mary Todd was very excited about that. She actually went. Oh, I forgot to mention one little thing. I'm sorry. There's a little boy there. She had a second child, Edward. <laughs> that was one of the little things that had happened. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I'm sorry about that. Oh, okay. So at any rate, um, Mary Todd did a very unusual thing. She moved from Springfield all the way to Washington, D.C. She was willing to live in a boarding house again. She really wanted to be part of Washington life, but it really didn't work. That wasn't what other families did. They tended to send their um, the legislative representatives um, without the family. and. Eventually, this was a time where she went back and visited her family in Kentucky and was reestablishing re those strong um, ties. It was also a very difficult time for Abraham Lincoln because for reasons which seem very legitimate to us now, he questioned the war with Mexico. And what he didn't check ahead of time, and he never made this mistake later on, is that the people he represented did not agree with the position he was taking. And so ultimately, you know, he's gone to Congress, but he did the things in Congress that would result in his not being reelected, not even going up. So that his, you would have thought that this would have been a big rise for Lincoln and for them, but this was, they followed, his going to the United States Congress was followed with a lot of dis disappointments in Mary Todd Lincoln's life. You had the death of her father. You had the death of her two grandmothers she cared about, and you had the death of her son, Edward, and it was 
really, really, really difficult for her to cope with all of these things, on top of the fact that the family, which had been kind of united when they had the father, now were starting to argue with each other over money. And those gifts that Mary Todd Lincoln got on their um, honeymoon, now Lincoln had to go to court for, to basically argue against family members who were saying they had to give the gifts back to the estate somehow, and several other family issues. But I've, I've joked, if you're going to have somebody who's going to come in from your family and be the lawyer for your family, you're pretty lucky it was Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> from this point, as um, unhappy as it was, Mary Todd Lincoln built everything up again. She had two more sons. Her son, Robert Lincoln, was um, sent to good schools. She started to rebuild the career and the family and all the things that you're probably familiar with that um, Lincoln did, like Frederick Douglass debates. Um, she was very much a behind the scenes person. That's why you see the little pen there. She was wonderful at trying to rally support and to try to create within her new house that she was building a salon. And she even managed to get a second story built on that house. And just in time, because the world needed to visit Lincoln in that house when he was unexpectedly the candidate, the first Republican, or the candidate for Republican um, president of the United States. And the way things worked in those days, you would actually, if you were the candidate, other people would campaign on your behalf. But all the other people who had to figure out who Lincoln was were coming to the beautiful house that Mary Todd Lincoln had built. And so at this point, that one little part of her life story is over. And we're gonna move on to John. John is going to pick it up from there and their travels to Washington. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, um, I'll pick up the story of the first Tuesday in November 1860. As now, election day. We're in Springfield, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> no, we're not. We're in Springfield, Illinois. I, I got the wrong state. <coughs> um, the election results are coming in, and it is facilitated by this new invention, the telegraph, uh, but not very quickly. Uh, Lincoln and his supporters move a couple of times, and finally it's now past midnight, and we still don't have final uh, results. So we adjourn to what they called then a ice cream saloon. I like that marriage of names. <laughs> and while there, Mary was with them, helping uh, everybody uh, enjoy the, uh, the festivities and, uh, and the hopeful <coughs> wishes. Uh, a telegram arrived reassuring and guaranteeing that he would carry New York, and that sealed his electoral victory. Mary, filled with joy, pride, and great uh, sense of responsibility. She indeed was an important factor in the outcome of this election. Her organization, political knowledge, social contacts, intelligence, independent strength, and financial management all contributed to making Lincoln able to be in the position he was, and he fully appreciated it. <coughs> a large part of her story from here on is going to revolve around her overspending, which is unusual for such a talented woman and a mystery we will look into. The Lincolns would soon contend with an unusual and perhaps unique series of stressors. They were, for national office family, relatively poor. They lacked national experience. Their families were split, north and south. There were crushing family losses to come, some of which Mary could mourn, some of which she could not. And most uniquely, of course, they were the, involved in a civil war. There's no book for how to play a civil war. The new impact and scandal manufacturing ability of newspapers was multiplied phenomenally by this new 
widespread invention, the telegraph. Not to mention the speed with which things could be moved around by the railroads. The telegraph, by the way, became transcontinental in October of 1861. So news could move around very quickly. And history records at least nine scandals involving Mary Lincoln, and there you see them. Overspending, I mentioned. Spiritualism. Treason, spying, political interference, gift solicitation, kind of tied to the overspending, inappropriate associations, sexual indiscretions, and fashion faux pas. That is the only French phrase you'll ever hear me pronounce remotely correctly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thus, I titled the White House years of Mary Lincoln. Uh, a rude awakening. But even before the inauguration, she has got to get her wardrobe ready for this new stage upon which she'll perform. And she travels to New York City, not only shops there, but engages in her usual activities, making political contacts, making statements on her husband's behalf that her husband and the National Party don't exactly appreciate. She's already getting in trouble. She decides, except for the first day on the trip, to go on this long trip. And you see the dark line goes up. It, instead of a straight line when the train gets to Pittsburgh, it goes up into northern Ohio. It swings all through New York, down through New Jersey, Philly. Uh, it is more or less a post-campaign trip for Lincoln. And she's with him all the way. This is a stressful trip. People are there at every stop, even where he's not scheduled to speak. And she is also made aware of, and she's called for too, and she's not prepared for this at all. Uh, train travel is a luxury in that day, but a hardship for anyone. And she's also aware of the ever-mounting number of death threats. They form a bond with a young man, Elmer uh, Ellsworth, who will who is their unofficial bodyguard for this trip, and who will join a military unit as soon as he gets to Washington. And I'll get back to him in just a moment. Because from the uh, White House, one could see flying across the Potomac River a Confederate flag. And <laughs> Ellsworth leads a small group of soldiers over there to remedy the situation. He is one of the first fatalities of the Civil War, and his funeral is held in the White House. That isn't all that's held in the White House. You notice the picture there? Those are troops, incoming troops. They are domiciled early in the war in the White House. That wouldn't stress anybody who has to take care of the little things around the house, would it? <laughs> For the entire war, some military units will be bivouacked on White House grounds. The previous president, James Buchanan, said, hey, we have running water downstairs in the White House. Wouldn't it be great to have it upstairs? Well, it wasn't done during his administration, but it was being done now. All right, so we got troops, we have a funeral, we have people running pipes in upstairs, and guess what? All the formal rooms on the first floor, except for three, are really in bad shape, and the upstairs isn't at all set up for Lincoln's family. So we have remodeling, redecorating, plumbers, soldiers, funerals, nothing serious. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, okay. So Mary Lincoln's job, of course, is to handle these little things. One of the little things she has to do uh, is, I say, renovate the rooms. So she goes again on New to New York, many trips to New York. And merchants, just like potential contractors today, would do what? They would flatter you. They would offer you gifts. The Lincolns were getting gifts even before the trip down to Washington, D.C. There was no formal or governmental rule as to how to handle these gifts. 
Now, some of these gifts that the merchants gave Mary Lincoln, a year or two later, they sent bills for. And I don't think they called it Indian giving at the time, but that's about what it comes <laughs> down to. She spent what she thought was the amount needed to adequately redecorate and overspent by quite a bit. Not knowing that one could ask for a deficiency appropriation from Congress, she found other ways to do it, and the gardener submitted bills for things he never had, and that came out. That was a scandal. Um, others that were supposed to be her assistants had other motives also for political gain and appointments uh, and didn't help her at all the way they should. So what can I tell you about that? Um, she's also going to get in trouble just because of the people uh, she goes with. Uh, the, the Lincolns and all presidents are of course expected to do all sorts of ceremonial things. Well, she rapidly finds out, man, I don't even have enough money to do what I think is necessary. So when State Department says you must hold a state dinner, Mary Lincoln goes, okay, I'll do it. And she does a great job at it and sends the bill to the State Department. <laughs> She's no dummy. By the way, most of her assistants were rapidly in the, uh, in the first year uh, assigned to the military, given military commissions. So guess who paid their salaries? The military, another way of getting around the budget. Clothing, of course, was the mo one of the most important things and still is. I mean, all we have to do is be reminded that uh, not too long ago, uh, the First Lady, uh, Michelle Obama, appeared in a dress without sleeves. Holy smoke, it made news. It was a shock to me. But, okay, <laughs> costuming uh, the, uh, the, 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 the marriage partner of a president is always news. And Mary wanted to be a leader in this fashion. All the fashions were coming from France, from a very elegant young woman whose body style did not match Mary Todd Lincoln's. And so most of her attempts, although fashionably correct, she didn't display them the best way for reasons she could not Alter. But she was also frugal in this way. She hired a seamstress to work for her who created most of her clothes throughout the years and became her very close friend and, con and, and confidant. She's also an ex-slave. This causes a controversy all by itself. She's associating with the wrong people. But Elizabeth Keckley also is her pipeline to what's going on in the Negro world of the early Civil War. They're not freed. There is no Emancipation Proclamation. They're going under the name of contraband. General Butler gave them that name, um, just like appropriated property. And the contrabands had formed a large community in the Washington, D.C. area and needed virtually everything, clothing, food, shelter, no education, no direction. Elizabeth Keckley brought this to Mary's attention. What you see on the left is a letter that Mary wrote supporting the group and made an initial contribution of $200 to this group. Uh, for all money, Civil War time, a rough way to make an equivalent to, the, to today is to multiply it by 40. Wow. Okay, so it's uh, quite a contribution she makes. Mary Todd Lincoln was then eagerly involved in issues of race, <coughs> equality, health, soldiers, morale, and health. And if we want to draw another rough equivalent to something <coughs> we're a little more conversant with, think Eleanor Roosevelt. She is the first First Lady to be called First Lady in print. She tries to live up to this, and like we all have, perhaps now or certainly when we were younger, we had a picture of the perfect family. And Mary had every hope of having that picture come true when they moved into the White House. Well. Ellsworth's death 
Another friend of the family, Baker, died also that year. His funeral was also in the White House. Uh, they'd lost Willie. By the way, probably from a disease communicated by the water brought him to that second floor. As a matter of fact, the whole family got ill from it, but Willie succumbed to it. There were a lot of waterborne diseases then. Of course, he was also severely ill at the height of when Mary and Abe had to do high-profile entertaining. So, of course, he was criticized for putting entertaining above the health of her child, not to mention the Lincolns in general were pilloried for their child-rearing practices, which was, as one, described, one reporter described, Lincoln sitting talking politics with a group of his influential friends and having one of the sons climb in his lap, pull his ear, pull his nose, untie his tie, and Lincoln kept right on going as though the child weren't there at all. <laughs> to the distraction of everyone else in the room, but it didn't bother Abe. <laughs> well, this is another obvious fault of this uh, family. In her grief, she turns to spiritualism, which today sounds a little mystic, a little mumbo-jumbo. There are uh, census figures from the city of Cincinnati about this time. One out of every 100 residents of Cincinnati at this time listed their occupation as spiritualist. It was widespread, not unusual. Lincoln, however, had grave doubts about it and engaged the head of the Smithsonian to investigate it, and it was his opinion that this was a sham. But it did offer Mary some relief. Mary always had very violent uh, emotional swings. Uh, Herndon, one of the first biographers, uh, played this up and, and, and said that Lincoln's marriage was hell. Uh, Lincoln's secretaries, Nikolai and Hay, also had it in for Mary. Um, however, Lincoln paid about as much attention to her emotional outburst as she did the kids climbing in his lap and pulling his nose and the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. He knew that she needed this release and it didn't bother him. And he was near as much as it bothered everyone else. But the thing that was really getting Mary was during this whole war, and as we can tell by photographs, she watched her husband age before her eyes, and there wasn't much she could do about it. They both needed support for each other as a family, and the war would not allow it. Just wouldn't allow it. They both suffered from bad press. Mary Lincoln is the one who we now know, boy, she had all the scandals surrounding her. Well, Abe wasn't loved much either. It was his fortune to be assassinated on Good Friday, to be the topic of every church's Easter sermon. This changed the view rapidly on Lincoln. Never happened for Mary. Anyway, at this time, as the war's near the end, she not only eagerly goes to uh, trips for, for troops and stuff, but they plan trips. Except for maybe the, uh, the trip uh, Abe made to Gettysburg, he never went anywhere. He stayed at his job all the time. They planned for trips. They yearned to have fun. They established these dreams. And of course, then came mm -hmm. that famous, let's go to a silly play night out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, everybody knows what happened at Ford's Theater. And that his body, never to speak from the time he was shot until he was pronounced dead the next morning at a little after 7, and taken across the street to a cramped apartment in a bed too small for him, where all these very proper adult males get this hysterical woman out of here, and for heaven's sake, send her home with her kid. Well, if she felt shunted aside and unable to gain her emotional balance, it sure happened. She did not accompany the body or go to any of the funeral processions for her husband. In fact, when the body 
got to Springfield, Illinois, not Massachusetts, uh, she became immediately embroiled in a, in a big argument. Both she and Abe had decided before he was president that when they died, this rural cemetery, about nine miles south of Springfield, would be a wonderful place to be a final resting place. Springfield thought, hey, the center of town, this is going to be a tourist magnet we wanted here. The quarrel grew in intensity, and finally they gave in, let the widow win. After his body gets there, and briefly interred in a temporary tomb in the rural, they purchase ground in the center of town and begin plans to put it back in the center of uh, Springfield all over again. Mary threatens, if in 10 days you don't change your mind, I am going to acquiesce to the people in Washington, D.C., who want him interred in the place that was originally designed for the body of George Washington in the Capitol that had never been used. Mm -hmm. They gave in. What you see there is the tomb that was eventually built and housed Lincoln. She visited the grave once in December of 1865 with her two remaining sons, the young Ted and the mature and very much estranged from his mother, Robert. And I think that's where I'm going to leave it, except um, no, I have a few more minutes to go. Uh, yeah. She then leaves the country with the youngest. She goes to Germany. She spends a couple of years there. She returns. She's also embroiled fighting the government for a pension. There is no pension for ex-presidents. There's no pension for retired Supreme Court judges, which is one of the reasons why Supreme Court judges hung on so long. Because when they quit, they were out of money. Uh, in 1871, she is the beneficiary of a $3,000 government pension. In 1871, Ted dies. This turns her spending mania on high gear. And I'm done for now. <laughs> All right, and Diane's going to pick up from there, this um, right after the assassination of President Lincoln. Yeah, I can bring up my first slide. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to talk about his quadrangle. <laughs> about something I didn't really know about Mary until I got involved with this group, and that was that, uh, and you've heard much evidence of it to this point, that she <clears throat> might have been considered insane. She had very odd behaviors. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> there were a number of reasons why Mary may have behaved uh, strangely. Many have been spoken of already. Uh, she may have been bipolar. She went through the agonies of the Civil War. The, the life in Washington was no different than it is now. It was a fishbowl. Everything she said or did was scrutinized and commented upon by people who liked her and people who hated her. Uh, and then, of course, the assassination of Lincoln not only was an emotional killer, it also deprived her of a house and the status of being first lady. So she had to deal with all of that. Uh, she had accumulated these debts that have been referred to and managed to hide them and disguise them and jiggle them around from department to department while she was in the White House. But now that she was no longer in the White House, they were hers to deal with. So she was in financial trouble as well. And then her last, well not the last, but the third son, uh, Tad, died in 19, 1871. And uh, that was just a, a terrible blow to her. So let's look at some of the people involved. We've seen them uh, earlier. Uh, that's Mary in 1872. And then her sister, one of several sisters, is Elizabeth. And her husband, uh, Ninian Edwards. And that's a, a picture of the house that they lived in in Springfield. 
she lived off and on in that house uh, well after after she left the White House. Uh, next slide. This is Robert Todd. This was the surviving son, the one who eventually tries to get her committed for insanity because of her erratic spending and other things. Uh, th that's his family. He had two children, Abraham Jack and Mary Harlan, and his law partner was Ever Edward Swift Isham. The, one of the other scandals that hasn't been spoken of yet was the, came to be called the Old Clothes Scandal. And that was uh, one of the ways she tried to uh, unburden herself of all the debts that she had accumulated was to try to sell the clothes and other memorabilia of her White House days. And so she, she contacted her friend who you've heard about already, Elizabeth Keckley, and enlisted her help in trying to get a broker to sell this stuff in, in New York. And she took on a, a pseudonym while she was there. However, you don't hide yourself as Mary Todd Lincoln. And so it was found out that she was doing this and erupted in a big scandal that uh, people did not think it was appropriate for the, for the widow of a president to be selling his uh, personal effects and other such things. So Elizabeth did um, uh, write, uh, the, the Keckley did write a book uh, the following year to try to put a more pleasant light on it, but uh, it, she still suffered that scandal, that's all right. So uh, before we get to the trial itself, I have to create the environment that uh, Robert Todd, in trying to get Mary committed, was looking at. In 1860, uh, Illinois opened its first mental asylum. And they also passed a law to decide how people would come to be committed. And everyone who was thought to be insane was, was eligible or was uh, privileged to get a trial by jury. It, with one exception, wives. Wives <laughs> could be, <laughs> it only gets worse. Wives <laughs> could be committed on simply the word of their husband. <sighs> and so this poor Elizabeth, uh, she had in her life suddenly decided she had different religious views than her husband, Theolopesis. I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, and so, uh, uh, he decided to get her committed and had uh, a doctor come over and interview her and because her viewers were different than her husband's, he had her committed. And her first knowledge of this was when a sheriff came to her door and hauled her away. Oh and, uh, and she spent three years in this institution. And it was only because other people not in her ch that church and her f other family, the children, made a, a loud amount of noise about <clears throat> it that the people running the asylum declared her uncurable and released her. So then there was a subsequent <laughs> trial where she, uh, again, she and her husband opposed one another uh, to uh, ascertain her sanity. And when they brought up a fair bunch of testifiers, <coughs> it was, it only took the jury seven minutes to determine that she was fully sane and they released her. This wasn't the end of her problems because her husband, in the meanwhile, had rented out their house and taken the children and all the assets someplace else. So she, she was sane but homeless and penniless. But she uh, started a society for the uh, preser for the uh, uh, looking out for uh, insane people and managed to get a law passed in uh, 1871, I think. Uh, I think it was 1871, to, um, to have everybody have the option of a ju jury trial to determine their commitment. So that was what Robert was <coughs> facing when he decided that, uh, go to the next slide, when he was uh, mounting his uh, effort to get his mother, Mary Todd, uh, committed. So uh, he hired this uh, notable uh, attorney, Leonard Sweat, uh, and he, uh, next slide, assembled a, an impressive bunch of doctors, both medical and mental doctors. And the ones on the right are the, uh, are the uh, doctors. They hadn't actually interviewed Mary. They just read the, the stuff that had been written ahead of, the t ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So they just offered an opinion based on other people's comments. The presiding judge at her trial was Marion Wallace. Next slide. Now Mary had an attorney, and it was one also selected by Leonard Swift, and it was this fellow, Isaac Arnold. Well, 
Isaac really did not do her a lot of good in that trial. And she was, in fact, committed. Uh, next slide. And she went to, uh, did we miss a slide? Um, I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, uh, well, it doesn't really matter. What the, the slide, oh, no, we didn't. Uh, so at the trial, um, at the trial, there were a variety of people that were testifying, uh, in addition to those doctors who you saw in the earlier slide. Uh, there were a number of them were from a, the Grand Pacific Hotel where Mary was staying. And the first uh, person up there is Mrs. Harrington. And um, Mrs. Harrington was the housekeeper at the Grand Pacific. And she testified that Mary's closets were filled with packages that she purchased and never bothered opening. She just accumulated things but never looked at them. I think it was the act of buying that she liked, not the actual possession or use of the things she bought. She bought things for houses that she didn't own. She bought clothes that she had no place to wear. She just had lots of stuff like that. Did Mary Gavin was... Hoarder. Hoarder. Yes, yeah. that you would call her a hoarder. <laughs> I, I understand that mentality. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, Mary Gavin was one of the... Uh, was a servant there and said Mary was afraid to stay alone and that she went out shopping at least once a day and that she had conversations with imaginary people. Who of us doesn't do that? <laughs> <laughs> and then she also had, they also had a variety of salesmen with whom Mary had uh, done business who reported her extravagant uh, and erratic purchases. And then also Dr. Danford was, was a actual doctor who had actually seen her and he testified to her mental illness over the past couple of years. And then the manager of the Grand Pacific Hotel reported an incident where Mary reported that the south side of Chicago was a fire and that they ought to do something about it. Of course it wasn't, but, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless. She, and then she also complained that some man on the other side of the wall was talking to her. And there was no man on the other side of the wall. So, and the last person uh, that I listed was Robert Todd Lincoln himself uh, testified. He talked about her erratic speaking uh, spending and also the fact that it, he became aware of the fact that she thought Robert was trying to kill her. And uh, so it, 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 estrangement would have been a tame word to talk about the, how these two felt about each other. So it didn't take the jury long. And by the way, the jury was picked up very prominent people in Chicago so that there would be some, some veracity to the verdict. And it didn't take long for Mary to be uh, found insane, completely insane, and sent to Bellevue Place, which is about 60 miles east, you know, west of uh, Chicago. Uh, and it uh, was run by Dr. Richard Patterson, who cared for her personally. And this is a picture of the house. Uh, and it isn't, it isn't exactly what I pictured, and probably what you pictured an insane asylum to be like at that time. She had free reign of the place. She could come and go as she wanted. She could have visitors, she could write letters, and she did all of those things. Next slide. Uh, she invited uh, several people up. Uh, two of them are the Bradwells, uh, uh, both attorneys and good friends of Mary, and quite, quite prominent in their own right. Uh, she, uh, Myra was a women's rights advocate, and she brought with her a reporter from the Chicago Times who interviewed Mary for a newspaper article. And he took everything she said as verbatim and came the next day the paper came out with, Mrs. Lincoln is entirely sane. So this helped fuel the controversy about having the former first lady in an insane asylum. And uh, judge, the judge uh, wrote a letter to poor old Dr. Patterson, who is now between a rock and a hard place, <laughs> uh, and, and insisted that he free her. And uh, this also then put Robert Todd in a bad place because now he was the sole remaining stalwart who wanted to keep her there. But he finally uh, stepped back and said he wasn't going to contest it anymore. And so a second trial of her sanity was took place only three months after the first one. And she was uh, declared sane and released. However, Robert still was her conservative. Cons oh, yeah, next. Uh, uh, next uh, slide. 
I forgot to tell you that slide. <laughs> uh, the slide, the slide, the next one. Uh, oh, this is, uh, by the way, the uh, attorney that represented Mary in her second trial, and he did a, a better job. And of course, he didn't have quite the gang that, uh, that the first lawyer had to, to testify against her. It was essentially a short trial, the second trial. So in, uh, next slide, last slide. In September of 1875, she was released to her sister Elizabeth back at that uh, home that you saw. And uh, while staying there, she, I got to fail that she was really, she, <laughs> she started carrying a gun around uh, where she was, if, she, if Robert had visited, he probably would have had to undergo major surgery because she wasn't going to shoot him. She also carried a great deal of money on her person because she still hadn't gotten her money, her conservatorship uh, released back to her, so she carried the money on a money belt 24 hours a day. Uh, she wanted to get rid of Robert, and so she contacted the governor for help and agreed to have Jacob Bunn act as a new conservator if she needed one. And in June 15, 1876, her estate of 81,000 and change was restored to her. Uh, and she was really vindictive. She wanted all the things that she had actually left at Robert's house for his use and probably were gifts. And she wanted them all back. Although she had no place to put them, she just wanted them back to be, be nasty. And then realizing that she might be, uh, she could still suffer another insanity challenge, she decided she would leave the country. And so uh, she, she made her sister Elizabeth uh, <coughs> keep the secret. She left town with the grandson of her sister, Edward Baker, and proceeded to go to France.